Hello, and welcome to Radio Free Acting, the podcast of the Acting Institute, dedicated to the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, and on today's show, you'll first be hearing a conversation between myself and Joseph Connors, who's an assistant professor of economics at Florida Southern College. We'll be discussing the good news about poverty, how poverty rates have been falling, and how we can continue the progress. Then on Upstream, where culture is upstream from politics, host Bruce Edward Walker talks with Alex Chafwin, Acton's International Managing Director. They'll be talking about Operation Finale, a new movie depicting the capture of the infamous Nazi Adolf Eichmann after he escaped to Argentina following World War II. Alex brings firsthand experience to the conversation, having lived in Argentina himself, in the same neighborhood as Joseph Mengele, a German officer and physician in Auschwitz concentration camp. If you're interested in any resources, books, or articles mentioned in the episode today, you'll find them linked in our show notes, posted every Wednesday at blog.acting.org. It might come as a surprise, but poverty rates in the developing world are dropping dramatically. In fact, economic growth in developing nations has far outpaced the growth of high-income countries. Not only has the world experienced a historic reduction in poverty over the last 25 years, but global income today is much more equal than at any time in the last 100 years. I'm your host, Caroline Roberts, and today I'm joined here on the podcast by Dr. Joseph Connors, Assistant Professor of Economics in the Barney Barnett School of Business and Free Enterprise at Florida Southern College. He's here to talk with me about the fall of poverty in light of an upcoming Acton event here in Grand Rapids on September 27, and I'll give you a few more details about the event and how you can register at the close of this segment. Joe, thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, Thanks, Caroline. It's good to be here. In an article from the Washington Post published this past August, it reads that we are at a, quote, critical juncture. After thousands of years of most people on the planet living in some kind of destitute scenario, half the population now has the financial means to be able to do more than just survive. Um, Additionally, in a study published by Our World in Data, it shows that 2.2 billion people living in extreme poverty in 1970, and there were 705 million people living in extreme poverty in 2015. So the number of extremely poor people in the world is three times lower than it was in 1970. We're going to dig into this further, but first, what do you believe explains this change? So I would say there's two two kind of large-level uh, factors that can help explain that change or the reduction in poverty that we've basically seen over the last 30 years. Um, the first has been uh, what my co-authors and I like to call uh, kind of the transportation communication revolution. And what that is is that it is now uh, basically starting kind of in the 1970s and into the 1980s, it is now much easier for developing countries to plug in to global markets. As you look at kind of the history of economic development, it really starts with the Industrial Revolution uh, back in the early late 1700s, early 1800s, starts in the UK and England, spreads to the US, continental Europe, uh, and to other countries. But it really kind of stopped. The Industrial Revolution really stopped with kind of today's high-income countries. It never really spread to the rest of the developing world. And one of the issues is that the Industrial Revolution was about factories and machines and building up lots of capital so that you can have these high-productivity factories. Um, That's difficult to do in poor countries. But starting in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, with kind of this transportation communication revolution, people in poor countries could become a part of kind of a, the global marketplace. Um, and as we know from Adam Smith and many others, right, the more the more people you can trade and exchange with, uh, the better off you will be. So uh, that's part of the story. The other part of the story is that there have been some improvements in what we call economic institutions. So there's been improvements in um, in monetary policy. I mean, that's kind of the biggest uh, or the easiest thing that's been improved. Uh, the second improvement uh, has been actually in opening up to the outside world. There's been a, a significant reduction over the last 30 years in trade barriers, in uh, tariffs, a lot of those things. And so many more countries have kind of plugged into the global economy. So regarding the role of foreign aid in this reduction of poverty, do you think that it's helped or hurt? Uh, I think uh, foreign aid, I 
think largely the, uh, the impact of foreign aid has been largely neutral. Uh, and I would say the only way you could kind of see an impact of foreign aid is at a micro level, right? So if there is a project somewhere uh, that has maybe delivered drinking water to an area or a village, that's where you can see an impact. But in terms of the broader country level declines in poverty and, uh, you know, increases in economic growth, the literature has largely indicated that foreign aid doesn't have kind of a broad country level impact. Uh, the impact of foreign aid largely can be felt in smaller projects. And I think probably one of the most impactful things that foreign aid has done uh, or has accomplished has largely been pushed by Jeffrey Sachs, and that is helping to combat malaria. So if you look at um, incidences of malaria and deaths from malaria, starting in about 2000, so about 18 years ago, um, those started to decline. Um, and so that's going to be uh, very helpful. I mean, that's a big obstacle for Africa. Uh, but I think it's projects like that, malaria, water, that foreign aid can have an impact, less so at the kind of the country level where you're talking about broad, sustained, long-term economic growth. The way that we've kind of framed this um, conversation or even the event is almost assuming that people don't already understand that poverty is being reduced. Do you right. find that this is true, that most people aren't aware of the change that's going on? And if so, why do you think that is? I would say that's the case. Um, I mean, I think slowly people are becoming a little more aware uh, that poverty rates have been declining. But I'd say in general, a, a lot of people still think that a good chunk of the world lives in destitute poverty. And you know, to be honest, there are quite a few people that live in a lot of poverty. But as you pointed out, uh, as you started the segment, there's been a massive reduction in that. Uh, and so I think hopefully slowly people will come to learn that. I think the kind of the misconception, I think, has to do with the fact that there's also a focus on income inequality. That is kind of the the difference between the haves and the have-nots, and that has that has driven a lot of the narrative. And so it's true, income inequality in the U.S. has increased a little, not a not a huge amount. It's increased a little bit, whereas in European countries it has actually declined a little bit. But I think the focus is on broadening income inequality, uh, some of the disparities we see in terms of development today, it's so much easier to see disparities in development today than it was you know, 20 to 30 years ago when it was much harder to see pictures and hear stories of what's going on in developing countries. So I think those things have driven the narrative. And so a lot of people aren't aware that, I mean, it, the last 30 years have been historic times in the sense that billions of people all right, have moved out of poverty. I mean, China's uh, what we call $1 per poverty rate, uh, basically in the late 1970s was about 98, 99%. That is, almost everyone in China lived in uh, abject poverty. Right? By today, I think that number is down to 7.6%. Uh, right? So that's a, that's a huge reduction. Similar reductions in India. Um, and so that's big. I mean, it's, there's hundreds, hundreds of millions of people moving out of poverty just in China alone. One writer for Acton, John Miltimore, he described in a recent blog post the rise of the middle class, writing that from a global perspective, living in the middle class means having basically luxury items that most Americans view as basic essentials. So access to transportation, air conditioning, electricity in their homes and running water. So in global regards, Americans have almost more of a skewed definition of the middle class, you would say. Do you think that this might account for some of the misconception regarding the fall of poverty rates? Yeah, I think so, um, because when you see, and many developing countries around the world have, you know, have made great strides, but still, if you're comparing our standard of living to other countries, yeah, I mean, other countries still have a long way to go, and so that that probably definitely, you know, colors people's attitudes in terms of thinking, well, you know, they don't have. Well, actually, I was going to say they don't have iPhones, but actually, many of them do have iPhones now, uh, and a lot of them do have air conditioning. Uh, but, you know, uh, they don't have as many of the, the comforts that we have. But, I mean, people need to keep in mind, the United States started its development path, you know, around 1800. These countries really just started to develop in the last 20 to 30 years. So 
give them some time. I'm thankful for the progress having been made in the past century and especially the past few decades. But I do realize that we still have a lot of work to do. And what do you think is the biggest obstacle we face in the future? Uh, I would say actually, well, I'd, I'd say there's a couple obstacles, especially if we want to talk about uh, Africa. So many of the poorest countries in the world are still in Africa. Uh, Africa has a lot of hurdles uh, to deal with. And first among them is malaria. So malaria is, uh, again, it reduces your kind of productivity. Um, it's, it's tough to deal with. Um, and especially for a poor person, it can be expensive to treat. Um, so if we can make strides in terms of reducing the impact of malaria, uh, I think that will be helpful. Uh, I think a, an additional thing, and of course it's a harder, I guess, harder thing to change, and that is right, a lot of the economic institutions, and this kind of goes back to your point about how in the U.S. there's a lot of things we take for granted. And one of the things that we take for granted are the kind of the good institutions or the good rules and governing kind of institutions that we have, whether it's courts, uh, whether it's the way our market is structured. Um, many developing countries don't, you know, don't have that or it doesn't work as well as we would hope it would. Now, reforming and improving those institutions is tough to do, so that's kind of another roadblock that many uh, countries will have to deal with. Not just African countries, but countries all over the world, right? Bad institutions, corrupt institutions, uh, those are hard to, to change and, and kind of reform. Well, unfortunately, we are all out of time, but I want to thank you, Joe, for taking the time to speak with me today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and we look forward to having you here at the Knickerbocker in Grand Rapids later this month. You can hear Dr. Joseph Connors talk more about the fall of poverty, and your first beer is on us. Register at acting.org slash events. Arthur Vandenberg was an American politician from Michigan and served as a senator from 1928 to 1951 and even participated in the creation of the United Nations. Come out to Acton Institute on September 20 to hear Hank Meyer, executive chairman of Meyer Inc., speak about how Senator Arthur Vandenberg forged a consensus that helped make the American century. Seats are limited, so make sure to save your spot and register at acton.org slash events. Hello and welcome to Upstream. I'm your host, Bruce Edward Walker, and today I am speaking with Alejandro Shafowin, who is Acton's own international expert on economics and travels around the world doing special reports on all matters economics for the Acton Institute. Welcome, Alejandro. How are you today? Very well. Well, the, the reason we wanted to have you on this week is because you wrote a brilliant essay for Forbes this week that discusses the film Operation Finale, which was just released in the United States about a week or so ago, which is about the capture and kidnapping of Adolf Eichmann in a Buenos Aires suburb. And as it turns out, you're very familiar with the case, and you wrote a uh, a very long and very wonderful piece on this. So tell us a little bit about uh, your take on, on the film. It, and uh, I should add that it stars Ben Kingsley as Adolf Eichmann and Oscar Isaac as the man responsible for capturing him and bringing him back to Israel for trial. Well, as I was born in, in Argentina uh, uh, and lived 30 30 years there, you know, and uh, Mengele ended up being a neighbor. I did not know at the time. He left when I was only four years old, four or five years old. Uh, it is a topic that uh, has fascinated me since I learned about, uh, about that. We had a, a dictator, a democratic dictator, if you would, because he was elected but ruled as a dictator by the name of Juan Domingo Perón, that was really a, a big fan of Mussolini and, uh, and the Nazis. And then he allowed them to come to, to the country, you know, allegedly in exchange of part of the big, big fortune. But you know, everything that had to do with that situation, how the rule of law was bent, modified, uh, the, the way that privileges and permits are being bought or, or sold, I think still haunt Argentina, uh, uh, my na native country. Uh, I, I decided I had to go and see the, the movie because 
uh, all the movies that I saw tended to have uh, historical uh, mistakes, which in a way perhaps helped the Nazis evade uh, capture for a long time. Now, when you say that the, uh, the historical mistakes in some of the cinematic adaptations of what happened uh, enabled some of these Nazis to evade capture, precisely what do you mean? Well, I know more of the case uh, of, of Mengele, who you know the... the, the People call him the angel of, of death, you know, the doctor of death, because he used to decide who lived and who did not, and then conducted all these experiments, you know, human beings. You know, when I first saw a document where it said where he lived, it was in a street called Viceroy Ortiz, in Spanish, Virrey Ortiz, and we never, Argentina never had a Viceroy Ortiz, so, but everything else pointed to my neighborhood, so... <laughs> Uh, where I continued to find, to look for it, and yes, it was three houses away from mine, and uh, uh, it was actually Viceroy Vertis, the Rey Vertis, uh, and uh, again, if, you, if the audience goes and to Google it, Google will point you to a mis uh, one block away. Uh, you can see the house <laughs> in Google, but it's basically next to the one called the Rey Vertis 968. The next one to that is the one of Mengele. But even the latest book, this one called The Real Odessa by an Argentinian, totally cultured, you know, educated uh, abroad, uh, written in the 21st century and revised, he argues that this house, you know, uh, uh, was back to back with the Argentine presidential palace. You know, it's a joke, correct? It's like uh, two miles away from the presidential palace. It was close to a house, close, but not back to back, to a house that Peron used when he came back in the mid-70s uh, uh, to take back the presidency uh, away from a leftist group that he had endorsed, uh, but he was more in the line with the orthodox fascism, you know. So, but again, the fact that if people would go looking for Virrey Ortiz or, uh, or a house near the presidential palace, you wouldn't have never found uh, Mengele. So, so that's why I see someone like him uh, all, uh, also use uh, an, an alias. His nickname, his name was usually he used several alias names. Uh, one most the most popular was called Helmut Gregor, uh, and um, and he was always a step ahead of those who wanted to catch him. Eichmann was less lucky uh, and, and was captured in, in 1960 uh, and uh, taken to Israel for, for a trial. And it's pretty amazing that uh, Mengele evaded capture forever and uh, died swimming on a beach uh, from a heart attack. Uh, it, it was unfortunate that he was never brought to trial or uh, never had to pay for his Nazi crimes. How would you compare the film Operation Finale to other films that uh, depict some of the same themes like Marathon Man, The Boys from Brazil? I'm thinking of Mother Night, a film based on the Kurt Vonnegut novel that, that starred Nick Nolte. It's pretty accurate. Uh, there were there are three or four scenes, you know, that to add tension uh, to the movie uh, that did not take place, you know, as uh, the history was really. But that is allowed in, 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 in movie making. I, I would say that 90% of the movie is historically correct. And unless you're anti-Israel, you know, it is, not, it is not biased, according to me, correct? Many people, like this chap that I mentioned who wrote the book, The Real Odessa, Ukigoni, his long book uh, tries to attack particularly the church, correct? Other people would try to attack, attack you know, uh, only Peron. Other people would speak about the Swedish connection and others even the, the British connection because supposedly there are books written that the British allowed Martin Bormann to escape, you know, and they, they have copies of documents trying to show that Martin Bormann also left to Argentina and that these guys were trying to establish a, a new a new fourth Reich, you know, uh, so the, the Nazis will come back. And the truth is that most of them uh, lived very uh, mediocre uh, lives and had to have a low profile. And I, uh, Mengele 
uh, was lucky that he came from a very wealthy family, uh, family that produced the major agricultural uh, products, uh, machines, agricultural machinery. And again, uh, I think freedom is different than wealth, but if you have access and contact to the multinational corporation, because the Mengele's uh, products were being sold in Latin America, uh, I think he had a better network uh, to help him be one step ahead of those who were trying to bring him to justice. Well, one of the things you bring up in your article is that you don't believe that there was this heavy group of Argentinians that were working in cahoots with with the Nazis to protect them and to establish a Fourth Reich. I don't think that was actually the case. And, you know, I'm also thinking of uh, some scenes from Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious, where uh, Claude Rains and the uh, bad Nazis are hiding out in in Buenos Aires looking to reestablish the Fourth Reich. Um, it, it makes for good dramaturgy, but it doesn't really uh, reflect what actually happened. What happened, you know, it was, it was such a sad period uh, of history. Uh, and if you watch the movie, you would see how even the Eichmann's culturally, uh, Klaus supposed, supposedly befriended, you know, a Jewish girl, you know, without knowing that she was Jewish. Um, but it's true that these uh, Germans uh, decided to live in uh, to live in neighborhood where uh, we had several Jewish neighbors. You know, correct. So, one of my <laughs> I was born into a family uh, with uh, my grandfather was educated in Austria in the University of Vienna, and married to an Italian. And my father was from mostly from English origin. You know, who several of his mother's relatives and cousins went to fight the Nazis in Europe. And um, but the, the German side, my mother, you know, had one of her best friends was Jewish, you know. But again, she she had big, deep admiration for the German culture, and, and many of them wanted to forget uh, the horrors, you know, because many people early on, like in Germany, the Thyssen family, the Steel family, early on uh, supported uh, the the national the Nazi rise to power. But some of the great capitalist names, you know, of the United States, you know, before the United States declared war on Germany, uh, no, they were uh, building, you know, oil uh, refineries. They were helping them with their finance, you know, and their own legacy haunts Argentina. And uh, they were uh, very favorable to the Nazis, you know. So that existed, but not the uh, sort of... uh, conspiracy to bring them back uh, to power. It was mostly a conspiracy to get their loot, you know, their money, <laughs> and enrich themselves and maintain power uh, using part of the Nazi wealth. I, I found portions of the film to be kind of straining to find suspense where, and, and, and not entirely succeeding, even though you are really rooting for the uh, Israelis to extract Ben Kingsley without any harm to themselves. I recommend people, I have to recommend them to watch it before or after. They can find in YouTube the, the sort of, uh, not, not confession, the a, a whole narrative of the Mossad agent who cased uh, Eichmann and eventually captured him. Uh, because pa- a big part of the movie uh, is based on the conversations that took place between the agent and, uh, and, and Eichmann. Uh, although he was ordered, correct, to avoid speaking with, with him because, you know, you have this famous Stockholm Syndrome, you know, and one sometimes sympathizes with, with, with the evil side when you communicate. And uh, there's a, an author called Hannah Harren, you know, who, who just focus on some of these things uh, because slowly this, this agent uh, basically almost pays attention and sees the human on, on Eichmann, who says, I just, just obeying orders. You know, how would you have behaved? You know, you would order. You are doing this because the Mossad, you no, know, because your government uh, told you. And so it brings that. And, uh, and if you have read, read the records and you read the records and, and, and the testimonies, uh, those conversations uh, took place. And again, obviously, I. <laughs> I, I knew I knew the ending, uh, I, but not. I don't. I don't think it 
took place the way they said eighty percent is it's correct you know they ha uh, he had to be smuggled uh, out you know and don't want to spoil uh, the ending for some of the people who have not watched uh watched the movie uh, but um if there is a lesson you know uh, I think all of us in most parts of the world have neighbors who perhaps have collaborated with people who have committed atrocities you know in other countries you know if you are in Miami. How many rich Venezuelans who help the current Venezuelan dictatorship might, might be your neighbors? If you are in you know, in, in London, how many uh, you know? Sometimes we use as a nickname, uh, Londoningrad, correct? The, where, where do the billionaires of Russia put their money? You know, and again, uh, there have been crimes to humanity. There have been crimes to humanity are being committed today. You know, obviously, I do not know the international collection of the genocide in Burma, Burma, Myanmar today. But again, it, uh, I think, uh, you know, what, how long do we keep hunting all these criminals and the accomplices of criminals? You know, it's a question that all of us have to try to answer. And I think it's good to look forward. And it's not on black, black and white, you know, but the biggest perpetrators, I think, should face uh, justice, you know, yesterday, today and tomorrow. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alejandro. I do appreciate it. You're very welcome. We were talking about the film Operation Finale, which is in theaters as we speak. And for Upstream, I'm your host, Bruce Edward Walker. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to contact our podcast team here at Acton, you can leave us a message at 888-705-4180 or email us at rfa at acton.org. Let your friends know that they can now listen to Radio Free Acton on their favorite podcast directory, as well as Spotify and YouTube. And as always, if you like today's episode, don't forget to give us a rating on iTunes. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with sound mixing by Nathan Moore. 